On the evening of May 25th, 2003, as the sun was beginning to set, a Boeing 727 took off from Quattro de Fiberero International Airport in Luanda, Angola. This was not a planned departure, however. The 727, tail number N844AA, was not scheduled or cleared to take off and had no flight plan filed. Air traffic control tried to contact the plane as it made its way down the runway erratically, but received no response. The 727 took off, with none of its lights on, and its transponder not transmitting. The plane and the two men known to be on board it, who had been working to restore it, have not been seen since. N844AA had originally been part of the American Airlines fleet. It was manufactured in 1975 and flew for the airline for more than 25 years. In January of 2002, the aircraft was sold to Aerospace Sales and Leasing, a corporation in Miami, Florida, after American Airlines retired it from service. Because of the airline's strong maintenance program, N844AA was still in very good condition. The following month, the plane came to the attention of the man who would bring it to Africa, Keith Irwin. Irwin was a 57-year-old entrepreneur from South Africa. He had recently entered into a joint venture with Cargo Air Transport Systems, a company based in South Africa that had recently been awarded a contract to transport fuel to diamond mines in Angola. Angola's ongoing civil war had made ground transportation to the mines essentially impossible. Transporting goods by air was exceptionally dangerous, but still had a higher chance of success. The joint venture's sole investor supplied $450,000 U.S. dollars for the acquisition of an aircraft and flight crews from America. Irwin originally traveled to Miami to meet with a different corporation and lease a different aircraft. He originally planned to lease a 727 for a year and hire two flight crews, each with three members, for the same amount of time. This deal fell through, and Irwin lost $140,000 in the process. The six crewmen were still available, however, and Irwin soon met Mari Joseph, the owner of Aerospace Sales and Leasing, who had three recently retired 727s for him to choose from. Under his agreement with Joseph, Irwin would purchase an aircraft rather than lease it. The sale price was $1 million, and Joseph agreed to remove the passenger seats from the plane's cabin to make room for the 10 tanks Irwin had purchased to transport fuel. Irwin provided a down payment of $125,000 and was supposed to pay the rest of the amount he owed within 30 days. Irwin was allowed to take the plane to Angola, but Joseph sent one of his employees, Mike Gabriel, along with the six crew members to ensure that the remainder of the money would be paid. Keith Irwin, Mike Gabriel, and the six crewmen left Miami on N844AA on February 28, 2002. However, they did not arrive in Angola until March 14th. Irwin and his partners had failed to acquire the necessary permits to land the plane in Angola, leaving them in limbo for two weeks. They were finally able to pay the necessary fees and secure the required permits to land at the airport in Luanda. During this time and through this process, Irwin also spent all of the remaining $185,000 that had been invested in the joint venture. Several of the six crew members who had come to Angola to fly the 727 had previously worked in various parts of Africa, but the conditions they faced on this job were far worse than any they had previously worked under. The apartment where they were housed in Luanda had no drinkable water or electricity, and was near an open sewer. They were concerned about the heavily armed security guard assigned to the project. Of most concern to them was the fact that their passports had been taken away from them by the company that had hired Irwin's joint venture to transport fuel when they arrived in Angola. Their request to get the passports back was denied by the company, and they only received them after getting the U.S. Embassy to intervene. Two out of the six crew members flew back to the United States once they had their passports back, without receiving any of the salary they were owed. The other four crewmen stayed on in hopes of eventually being paid once all of the problems surrounding the venture were worked out and they were able to begin making the flights they had been hired to perform. Those flights would not begin for several more weeks. In addition to losing two of the members of his crew, Keith Irwin also lost his partner, Cargo Air Transport Systems, and had to find a new backer for the venture. He ultimately found one, but his 727 would now be making fuel deliveries for a new client. 
despite all of the problems with the business side of the operation. The 727 finally began making delivery flights in April. In 2010, one of the members of the flight crew spoke to reporter Tim Wright, but asked that his name not be disclosed. He was an Air Force veteran with 30 years of flight experience, and he described the conditions he faced during the delivery flights he made while working for Irwin as the most dangerous flying in the world. He and his fellow crew members had to base their approaches and landings to their destination at the diamond mines around avoiding ground fire, and the runways they had to land on were not paved, so their landing gear would often get stuck in the dirt. The runways were also not flat, and they witnessed other planes from competing companies crash on them. After seeing one of these accidents, the anonymous crew member fabricated a story about his mother being ill as an excuse to ask for time off to return to the United States. He did not return to Angola. By the end of April, all of the members of the crew had returned to the United States. Keith Irwin was able to find a local crew to continue flying the plane and making the fuel deliveries, but by May of 2002, his long-troubled venture completely collapsed. Around this time, Irwin believed he was being followed by someone hired by one of his partners. He began blocking the door of his hotel room at night. One night, he heard someone insert a keycard into the lock in his door, and the door unlock. Whoever unlocked the door could not enter the room because of the chair Irwin had wedged under the door handle, and was scared off when Irwin began yelling at him. The hotel's night clerk would later admit to hotel security that he had accepted a bribe to provide a copy of the keycard to Irwin's room. Irwin left the country the following day, leaving the 727 behind in Angola. Despite its age, N844AA was essentially in mint condition when it was first brought to Angola, but after only 17 delivery flights, it was practically falling apart. The harsh flight conditions it faced, as well as the stress of carrying tanks it was not designed to transport, rendered the plane worthless. It would never be of any value again, another one of Maury Joseph's clients would later say. You can't put water tanks full of fuel in an airplane and expect it to be good. Totally stupid. The plane remained parked at the airport in Luanda, accruing parking fees on top of the other fees and bills the aircraft had accrued during its brief period of use in Angola. Maury Joseph and Aerospace Sales and Leasing also had not been paid. Irwin made two payments towards what he still owed on the plane upon his return to Africa, but then stopped sending money before actually paying off the rest of the $1 million he had agreed to pay for the plane. Joseph had fired Mike Gabriel in the midst of all the chaos in the spring of 2002 for failing to secure these payments or bring the plane back to Florida in their absence. In November of 2002, Joseph traveled to Nigeria with another 727 he was planning to sell. He brought with him a man named Ben Charles Padilla, who was a freelance flight engineer and aircraft mechanic. Padilla was a native of Pensacola, Florida, and the son of a millwright, and his talent for working with all things mechanical had been clear ever since he was a child. He had an interest in aircraft from an early age, and earned a private pilot license in addition to all of his technical certifications. He lived in Florida with his fiance of 15 years, his stepchild and child, but was often away from home as he worked around the world as a freelancer, usually in locations across Africa and Asia. Ben came to Nigeria with Mari Joseph and the 727 to help with its transport and to explain its systems to its new owner once the sale was fully negotiated. In April of 2003, Joseph then sent Padilla to Luanda to oversee the process of making the repairs on N844AA necessary for it to return to service. While the plane as a whole was essentially junk at this point, it had relatively new engines, which were still of value. In order to recoup some of the losses he incurred from his disastrous deal with Keith Irwin, Joseph put the engines alone up for sale. He found a buyer for them in Johannesburg, South Africa, and needed N844AA flown there so that they could be removed from the plane and the sale could be completed. In Angola, Padilla was able to make arrangements with Air Gemini, an airline based out of Luanda, to make the necessary repairs to the 727 at their repair station at Quattro de Fevereiro International Airport. He hired local mechanics and oversaw the work, which progressed according to plan. In May, he hired crew members, again through Air Gemini, to help him fly the newly functional plane to Johannesburg on May 26th. On May 25th, 
Padilla and John Mutantu, a worker from the Republic of the Congo Padilla had recently hired, took the plane out of Air Gemini's hangar and onto a runway in order to run its engines as part of a systems check. It was during this check that the plane mysteriously took off and disappeared, along with Ben Padilla and John Mutantu. The following day, Mari Joseph was waiting for the plane in Johannesburg when he got an angry call from someone from Air Gemini, demanding to know why the plane had left Luanda ahead of schedule and without the crew that had previously been arranged for the flight. Knowing that he had not authorized any such changes, and that Ben Padilla would not have made any such changes without his permission, Joseph notified the U.S. Embassy in South Africa that a large aircraft had been stolen, and called his wife back in Florida to ask her to contact the FBI. Given the fact that the plane was seemingly stolen just 20 months after 9-11, American intelligence agencies immediately took interest in the plane's disappearance. The State Department sent word to every American embassy in Africa about the plane going missing. U.S. Central Command considered sending more fighter jets to one of their joint bases in Africa. While there have been reports of the CIA and NSA looking into the case, only the FBI and State Department have had official investigations into the plane's disappearance. The FBI ended their investigation in 2005. There are, of course, a myriad of other reasons why a 727 might be stolen. To be sold on the black market, to transport goods on the black market, to be disassembled for parts, and so on. Not everyone believed that the plane had actually been stolen, however. According to now-retired U.S. Marine General Mastin Robeson, who was the commander of U.S. forces in the Horn of Africa at the time of the plane's disappearance, the intelligence community also considered the possibility that N844AA had gone missing as part of an insurance fraud scheme. It was never clear whether it was stolen for insurance purposes by the owners or whether it was stolen with the intent to make it available to unsavory characters, he said in 2010. Mari Joseph does, at least on paper, seem like someone who might resort to fraud. He had lost a lot of money on a plane that was now largely in disrepair, and he had a history of questionable business practices. In the 1990s, Joseph had been the CEO of a cargo airline that ultimately went bankrupt. The Securities and Exchange Commission brought a civil case against him, alleging that he defrauded investors in the airline and falsified its financial documents. Joseph had to pay a fine and was barred from acting as an officer in any publicly traded company as a result of the case. He was obviously contacted by the FBI about his plane's disappearance and volunteered to take a polygraph. The client who was set to buy the plane's engines had been with Joseph when he learned that the plane was missing and does not believe that he played a part in the disappearance because of the genuine shock and confusion he displayed at the news. Ben Padilla's family is also adamant that he would not play any part in any sort of insurance fraud. If anybody would say to me that my brother was involved with this, they're full of it, Joe Padilla, Ben's brother, said in 2010. Because I know my brother. He's not going to do nothing crooked. I know that for a fact. Despite the fact that he was often away from his family, working outside of the United States for various private companies in what were often remote locations, Ben Padilla managed to stay in close contact with his family. The last communication they had from him was an email sent shortly before he went missing. The email was in response to one informing him that his mother had just had a heart attack. He promised to contact her as soon as he could. He never got the chance to before he went missing. According to Ben's family, someone else must have been on the plane that day and forced it to take off, as Ben would not have willingly participated in illegal activity of any kind. It would be easy to dismiss this belief held by the family as a result of their personal bias, but some of the facts surrounding the case do support the idea that Ben was forced to take off on N844AA. The fact that the plane took off at all supports the idea that an unknown person or group of people was involved in the 727's disappearance. It took three people, a pilot, a first officer, and a flight engineer, to operate a 727. Only two people, Ben Padilla and John Mutantu, are known to have been on board at the time the aircraft took off. Furthermore, Ben Padilla did have a private pilot's license, but he was not trained to operate anything even remotely close to a 727. John Mutantu had no training as a pilot whatsoever. 
Ben could have filled the flight engineer role, but two other pilots would be needed to operate the aircraft. Ben had also made the arrangements with Air Gemini to take the plane out of the hangar for the systems check in advance. This means that theoretically, someone could have found out about the check and hidden on board the plane before it left the hangar, with plans to take it over. The Padilla family continues to pressure the FBI to reopen the case and help them find answers about what happened to Ben. The Bureau says that this can only be done if new information is discovered. A Florida attorney began working with the family pro bono in 2004 to help facilitate their communication with the State Department and law enforcement. Almost no information is publicly available about John Mutantu, so it is unknown if he has a family who is also waiting and hoping for answers. Over the years, numerous theories have been proposed, and alleged sightings of the plane have been made. It was rumored to have been stripped for parts in Brunei. There was speculation that it was a plane that crashed off the African coast on Christmas Day of 2003, and a pilot claimed to have seen it at an airport in Guinea, its tail number partially painted over. None of these reports ended up being accurate. Perhaps the most obvious explanation for why the plane has never been found is that it crashed somewhere too remote either on land or in the ocean, for it to be located. However, even if this is the case, the mystery about why it took off in the first place still has no answer. Furthermore, there have never been any sightings of Ben Padilla and John Mutantu, and their whereabouts remain unknown. <laughs>